This is The Naked Patient, Beyond the Operating Room. Listen as Dr. Nicholas Howland talks with real patients about their real experiences with plastic surgery. Um, hello, welcome to The Naked Patient. With me today is my very good friend, Mr. Thurkle Nilsson. Hey, Nick. How are you, Thurkle? Good, good. So, tell everybody how to pronounce your name. <laughs> It's a circle with a lisp. It's a circle. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. Circle with a lisp. Thurkle. And it's, where does it come from? Uh, Scandinavia. Love it. Yeah, we, and. we, uh, my dad had a friend down there that was in Denmark. He lived in Denmark and he was a Scandinavian with his, the name of Thurkle Darling. And my mom didn't like the Thurkle Darling part uh, <laughs> when my dad gave me that name. So uh, he, he did Thurkle Devon. So. That's just, what we ended up with. I just want to let you talk, man. You've got you've got like this deep <laughs> radio voice with a little bit of southern twang in there. Uh-huh. Well, welcome to KCCA. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, we're just yeah, we're just gonna let you talk today, buddy. So you you are a little bit of a special guest for me because um, I most of the people that come on this podcast are patients of mine, and you have never been a patient of mine. We'll, we'll clarify that. <laughs> Maybe a future patient. Who knows what? Who knows what will happen? Well, I, I haven't applied for the mommy makeover yet, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> but you have had some plastic surgery, right? Like let's let's dive right into that, since you know, and technically we're a plastic surgery podcast, but uh, we really have kind of become more about interesting stories, and we're plastic surgery adjacent. But I do I I do want to talk about your plastic surgery because I think, at least I suspect that that shaped a little bit of your life. Yeah. Tell, yeah. tell me about that. So I was three or four years old, mm-hmm. and I we had a farm out in Riverton, and I was riding a horse that had been in the trail way too long with too many kids on it. And uh, we, we had a round pen. We were just going around and around and around as little kids on it, and that was a safe place. That was where we'd go. That was our recreation, mm-hmm. you know, get on the horse and rip it around the pen. And uh, it had been in there for too long, and it wanted to go back to the, to the barn, and my sister uh, was watching me, and she's deaf. She, she can't hear, but she knows sign language. Even at you know, three or four years old, she, she knew what you were talking about. And she was watching me, and I told her to get away from the gate because I knew the horse would take off for the barn. Mm-hmm. But she thought I meant open the gate. How, how did you get her attention? She was watching. Okay. She was just standing at the gate watching. Okay. And uh, we'd all take turns. So somebody would stand there and wait for someone to get done, and then next kid would get on it and ride it around. And, yeah. Anyway, so she uh, she thought I said open the gate. She opened the gate, and the horse seen that and just beelined for the barn. And uh, it took off at a dead run, and I was just holding on for dear life. I made it most of the way to the barn, uh, but we had a gravel driveway, and I came off in the gravel. Mm-hmm. And it ripped my the, my lip clear off on the front here, so it was hanging on on this side. Okay. So it was all the way under my nose and down one side was ripped off. Uh-huh. And... Then it took my bottom lip and ripped it clear down to the to the bottom of the jaw. Okay. And uh, they didn't notice that until after they after we got back home. Yeah. Then then uh, my mom says, "Oh wow, you you ripped the bottom of it too." Um, but yeah, they they put me on ice real quick, uh, held ice on it, and took me to the hospital. And there was a a doctor there that had just finished a class uh, about plastic surgery mm-hmm. and facial reconstruction and. And he heard the call go out. What year was this in? This would have been in, let's see, I was three or four years old, so it would have been like 79, 78, 79. Okay. Somewhere out there. And uh, he, he did facial reconstruction for, for uh, celebrities. Mm-hmm. And he happened to be leaving the hospital when the call came out for it. And so he went down to the emergency room to see what was going on, and, and they... They asked him if he wanted to, to do the surgery. Yeah. And he's like, well, yeah, I'm here. I'll, I'll help your guys do it. Yeah. And so he, he stitched us back together. And, and uh, so I do have a little teeny scar right under my nose and a little bit right there, but it's not, I mean, it held, held together pretty well. Yeah. No, it's beautiful work. But anyway, that's, that's kind of the story with, with my lip. What did that uh, tell me how that did change your life at all? If, if, if not, it, it may not have, but I'm, I'm um, curious if you had any difficulty eating afterwards, if you had fear of horses afterwards. You know, I, I still love horses. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like the taste of gravel anymore. 
Ja. <laughs> that went away. Um, but no, it, it really didn't uh, change that aspect of my life much. Okay. All right, you're drinking this no name brand water that Dakota brought in. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. You might like the taste of gravel. <laughs> I take what I can get. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, um, uh, like that's such a interesting, uh, uh, from a plastic surgeon's perspective, that doesn't happen today. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, yes, there's traveling surgeons. Like even I will go like, on occasion and, and give a lecture or, um, talk to either residents or other physicians. But if I was out of state at a hospital where I didn't have privileges mm-hmm. and some emergency came in and I was like, oh, I'm really good at this. I can do this. Well, I think he is actually from that hospital originally. Was he from there? Yeah. Okay. It's, I mean, yeah. it, it's, it was a different time, different place, but, uh, yeah, mm-hmm. that's it, what a, what a lucky <laughs> place to be in at that time. Yeah, definitely was. Definitely was. And, and, you know, I was glad that my mom put it on ice and, and got me over there. Yeah. You know, everything just lined up so well for him to, to be there. Yeah, absolutely. So, that was good. You'd, you'd, life would have gone a lot different had you not kept those lips. Yeah, well, yeah. The lipless wouldn't be good. No. <laughs> no. Um, okay, so that's the plastic surgery part is probably the least interesting thing about you, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's it piques my interest as a plastic surgeon. But you and I met um, as part of this We Are The They group, mm-hmm. uh, which our friend Jimmy Rex established. And it's pretty recent, just, in, just this year. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of, I kind of chuckle because I was, I was driving down here to interview you and I was trying to remember the first time we talked or connected and it was in Moab and I had gotten up and told part of my story, which is that I have been excommunicated <laughs> twice, uh, pause <laughs> twice from the LDS church. And I think you came up to me and you said, Nick. I also have been excommunicated. And mm-hmm. I said, oh, that's that's really cool. We've been there. And he said, not twice, and also not from the LDS church. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me tell me about that. Well, um, so we grew up FLDS. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and FLDS for, I mean, I've got a lot of LDS people uh-huh. that listen to this podcast that will know exactly what that is, but I think there's some that will not. Aren't, yes. So it's fundamentalist Mormons, basically. Mm-hmm. Not supposed to use the term Mormon anymore, I guess, but uh, sure. you know who we are. Sure. Uh, and we are, we have more than one wife. Well, so his, historically, let's break that down a little bit. Okay. So, um, and you can kind of correct me where I'm wrong um, or fill in some of these blanks. But so Joseph Smith, back in the 1800s, established mm-hmm. the the Mormon religion, which, you know, I'm going to use, I'm going to use the term Mormon here because mm-hmm. that's the culture. That's the people, whether we're calling them that or not, like that's, there are a lot of groups that adhere to the ner- the term of Mormon. Right. So this church that's become what it is today, a lot of people associate Joseph Smith with just the Latter-day Saints of Salt Lake city today. that's spread across the world. But in reality, um, there are hundreds of branches and sects and offshoots of that particular religion that Joseph Smith founded. Right. And so where, and, and we, we know that through kind of the study of a lot of people. One of my dear friends, her name's Lindsay Hanson Park. Um, she has studied and uh, gone extensively into polygamy and into the history of the Mormon church and the different branches Mm -hmm. of Mormonism that exist. Um, She runs Sunstone Project now, which is uh, their tagline is there's more than one way to Mormon. And uh, (laughs) that's a whole other topic. At some point, we'll get her on this podcast. But where does the FLDS branch that you fit into fall in that history? So back in, well, basically the time of the manifesto, when uh, the, the LDS church leaders made an agreement to not live plural marriage, mm-hmm. then in order to become a state, that was one of the prerequisites that they did away with plural marriage. So they signed off on that, and there was a lot of members in the church that were living plural marriage. They had more than one wife. And 
Now, all of a sudden, it's illegal in Utah to do that. So you've seen a lot of other states develop, like Idaho and Colorado and Wyoming and Arizona and even Las Vegas was founded from the, the Mormons. Mm-hmm. And a lot of it was because of the, the law that was passed to not allow polygamy, plural marriage. Um, and so a lot of the early founders of Colorado City, they were from the LDS church. And they wanted to live plural marriage the way that they believed it should be lived. Mm-hmm. So the community was founded around that principle. Um, it's right on the Utah Arizona border. And so it's, you know, I, I live right now one block from Utah, you know, so it's easy to get into Utah, easy to stay in Arizona. Yeah. But uh, in the early days, the, they, they settled out there because it was so far from anything. And they could, they could live their life the way they wanted, but they had to build the, the community, the town. Yeah. So they went out there uh, and got some big, huge homesteads in the early days and basically turned that into the community, started building roads and canals and, and the infrastructure to put it in. So who, who was the, uh, I'm, my history's a little bit fuzzy here. Who was the LDS prophet at the time? Was it Wilson? I don't know. It was, uh, it would have been in the early, what, 19, early 1900s, somewhere out there. Yeah. When they settled out there, and so I'm curious, with the FLDS religion, did they did they say, "Hey, the the church is doing this. We don't we don't believe this. We were gonna we're gonna continue living plural marriage." Did they then throw up a prophet and say, "This is our new prophet"? Yeah, basically, the they they decided who was gonna lead them, mm-hmm. and they settled that area with them. Um, so John Y. Barlow came from Bountiful. And he was one of one of the first leaders out there. Mm-hmm. He's actually my great great grandfather. Interesting. Um, and so yeah, they they selected who they're going to follow, and and they would support them and and you know, build them a house and make sure they had a place to live, and the people would just rally around and take care of them. Yeah, you know. And how did you become involved in the FLDS so, faith? My mom was, you know, a granddaughter of John Y. Barlow. Mm-hmm. And she was born in Colorado City. And so she, when she was married to my dad, my dad was an older gentleman. Uh, he lived up here in Riverton. Mm-hmm. And he was, let's see, how old was he when I was born? So he was born in 1902. Okay. I was born in 75. Oh, wow. So he was 73 years old. When I was born. Oh my gosh. And I'm one of the older children of, of his plural wives. Uh huh. And so there was 12 of us younger kids. How many wives did he have? Oh, five, I think. Um, yeah, with a, his, his first wife that he married, married in the church, in the LDS church, mm-hmm. um, we always referred to her as grandma. And she was the sweetest little lady. Uh, we, we just loved her to pieces. Um, and she died in, I'm thinking 1980. Okay. And my dad was in a, in a car or a truck crash in 81 and died. Okay. So they died pretty close together there. Yeah. So you only had five, six years with that first wife. Yeah. Well, with my dad too. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I was what, six when my dad died Mm -hmm. and, but I remember him, um, I remember his, his love and his, his patience. Um, he, he was a, a protector of his kids. He did everything for his kids. And that was his pride and joy. Yeah. So I, I remember one time I, I uh, broke a window. <laughs> and I, I was pretty embarrassed about it, but Dad got me a brand new pair of cowboy boots. Uh-huh. And I was like, my brother was supposed to be taking the wood from me that I was bringing into the furnace. And so I was tapping the window with my cowboy boots and it just shattered. And I was like, oh no, mom is going to whoop my butt. Yeah. And <laughs> she probably would have if she would have caught me. But <laughs> I went digging around the house and just did a dead run. And dad happened to be climbing in his car. 
And I go running up there. I says, Dad, Dad, I, I need to go with you. He's like, I can't take you, but what do you need? And I says, Mom's after me. Mom's after me. <laughs> and he looks back there and sees her coming around the corner of the house with a stick in her hand. And <laughs> I would have got my tail whipped. But uh, Dad grabs me and says, Oh, you're all right. I'll take care of this. So when Mom finally catches up, There you are, Thurkle. You come here. And my dad says, Oh, Luciana. Don't you hurt that boy. He didn't mean no harm. He wraps his arms around me and he says, like, now we'll go get this taken care of, won't we? He says, Luciana, will you go help him clean that mess up? You know, and just totally changed him. Yeah. Um, and that's the kind of dad he was. Yeah. You know, he's like, yeah, we didn't mean to do it, but let's figure out the, how to fix it now. How many siblings did you have? Well, there was 12 um, in, the, in dad's plural family. Mm -hmm. And there was... I think eight in the first family. They were married and gone before we ever came along. Okay. Uh, some of their kids are older than we are, mm -hmm. you know, so there's quite a time gap in there. Okay. Um, but yeah, it was, dad was always, always a protector. And if, if ever we got in the house and we were in trouble, and we could make it to dad. Mm -hmm. You know, he's the one that would take care of the problem. and He'd take us in the other room where he's supposed to give us a spanking, you know. And uh, he'd take us in the other room, and he'd shut the door, and it's like, all right, now when I slap my leg like this, you scream, scream. So he'd just slap <laughs> his leg, and we'd scream bloody murder. And and uh, he's like, all right, now rub your eyes, rub your eyes. And so we'd rub our eyes, and he'd come out walking with us. He said, he'll never do that again. And <laughs> Mom would sit there and look at him like, yeah, I'll bet he won't. <laughs> so, what, what was your relationship like with his other wives? It was good. Did, is it a, is it truly like a sister wives type of thing where they're all motherly towards you, or are they? I mean, what is that so, family life like? You know, right honestly, early on, I had to ask who my mom was mm -hmm. because all the mothers treated me as their own kid. Yeah, and I think deep down I knew, you know, but it was something that, you know, you you were accountable to all the mothers. And all the mothers make sure that you were taken care of. And, you know, there was a, a mother that would go and work during the day and come home at night. And there's another one that would tend the kids, you know, another one would take care of the farm, the gardens. And, and so everybody had their role. And wherever you need to be to help is where you went. Mm -hmm. You know, so, you know, I, I, I think the relationship was really good that way. You know, you see a lot of the drama and a lot of the stuff on Netflix and whatever it is. Um, but I think overall there, you know, the, you're always striving for that harmony and that, that cohesiveness between the, the mothers. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's such a, the, the worldview is still, I mean, even with the internet that we have and the history that we have, the worldview of, Mormonism and even FLDS and it is so skewed. Mm -hmm. I was in, when I was in residency, people kind of in med school, people knew me as the Mormon kid. That was before I had before I had gotten excommunicated <laughs> a second time. Um, and one of my colleagues would call me Big Love <laughs> based on that HBO show Big Love. And I'm like, no, dude, I'm Mormon. Like I didn't have multiple wives. It's like, uh huh, whatever, Big Love. <laughs> and it's just. Like there's people don't understand it. And so they see what Hollywood has decided to allow them to see. And that's, that's their only understanding of it. And that's quite sad, you know, because there's, there's a lot of fun and a lot of joy and, and teamwork and, you know, having your own tribe that, that you go do things with, yeah. you know, I mean, when I was growing up and, and I, I come home for a weekend you know, off of a construction site, I'd come home on the weekends and I'd say, Hey, let's go camping. You know, it wasn't, I'm going to take this mother's kids. It was <laughs> the whole family is going camping, yeah. you know? And so everybody that wanted to jumped in and we'd go out in the mountains and go camping. And it, it wasn't, it was never an exclusive thing with one mother's kids or another mother's kids. You know, it was, Hey, who wants to participate? Jump in, let's go. Yeah. And so you, you have a lot of teamwork that way, and you're always watching out for each other's bags. Yeah. So, you know, there's we, we just recently had a brother that passed away, and uh, 
he had been on dialysis for like 10 years or so. And he finally passed away. Um, and that was one of the first times that we had actually had, you know, all of the mother's children together. And even the mothers were there at this, at this viewing, you know, and it was, it was pretty awesome to see. Yeah. You know, the, all the kids we grew up with and our brothers that we haven't seen in, you know, 10 years, some of those were there, some weren't, but you know, a lot of them were there. So. So you, you paint this really beautiful picture of it. Like where does the, where does the bad come in? <laughs> uh, it is what we make it. Yeah. You know, um, you can go going through the, the last 10 years, you know, since 2013 was really, really hard mm -hmm. for the people. Um, you know, Warren Jeff set up the, the United Order and started separating families. Started uh, Warren Jeffs became the prophet of the FLDS faith. Yeah, early two thousands. Right, it was two thousand. What was it? Uh, yeah, early two thousands. I don't remember the year, mm -hmm. but he basically he he wanted people to live up to his his ideas. Mm -hmm. What was your relationship to? He was just a he was just a guy in the community, kind of a leader in the church. No, I knew him. Okay, um, my sister married him. Oh, okay. So I knew him. Uh -huh. <laughs> so he was family. <laughs> yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, I didn't know him really well. Mm -hmm. So he moved down from Salt Lake um, in in the early two thousands, before he's leader of the church. Um, he moved down with his with his dad, Rulin, and Rulin had a place down there early on, but he didn't. Mm -hmm. Rulin didn't, and so. Right, right around the time of the Olympics, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. Then there was a big call to for everybody to move out of Salt Lake. The destructions are coming, you know. Yeah. And so everybody literally sold their houses, their businesses, everything, and moved, which was a huge undertaking. Anyway, so when when Warren showed up down there, he he was basically a school teacher, and he would go out and he'd play basketball with the kids, and he'd he'd do plays and programs, and he could sing, you know, he'd he'd do a lot of musicals and stuff like that and for the community you know just everybody would get together and, and do it and he seemed like a pretty fun guy charismatic yeah and i didn't know him though you know um because he'd, he'd always lived up here and so my younger sister ended up marrying him and he became the leader mm -hmm. of the church she was not his first wife no okay nope and so after she married him, he, he was around a little bit, but then he went into hiding from the law and uh, disappeared. Mm -hmm. So we had no idea where he was at or what he was doing or anything. What sent him into hiding? Because the law came after him for just that he was practicing polygamy or because of underage girls? You know, I think it was a combination of it all. Mm -hmm. um, he, he always lived above the law. Mm-hmm. And so it could have been a multitude of things. Okay. Um, but their their typical response to a lawsuit was no response. Yeah. Don't respond, it'll go away. The Lord will protect us. Yeah. Well, you know, the Lord took the land from the UEP, or took the land from him in the UEP and reassigned it to the courts. So the courts ended up with all the property. Mm -hmm. And during that time, they were looking for all of the, all of the UEP trustees and the leaders of the church and anybody that they could get their hands on to bring them into court and talk about this, mm -hmm. you know, but they all avoided it. So ended up going into default where, you know, they got a default judgment against them. And so people could basically make ridiculous claims against the church and the church wouldn't respond. And so by default, they got the judgments. Mm. Um, so a lot of that's gone on, but Early on, you know, Warren was a pretty fun guy. And then he started set up the United Order and started saying, taking families and saying, well, the man is worthy, but the mother's not. Mm -hmm. So you two can't live together. What was the United Order? Uh, basically, uh, the law of consecration, uh -huh. um, where you give everything and you get what you need back. Mm-hmm. And if that's the way it really would have worked, it would have been great. Sure. Communism. But, but it didn't work that way. <laughs> you know, you would give everything in and not get what you needed back. Mm -hmm. 
And so one of the reasons I was kicked out um, was I was doing my shopping at Walmart because uh-huh. my family was hungry. Yeah. And I wasn't going to keep letting them be hungry. Yeah. And so I went to Walmart and I bought the food. Yeah. And I got called into the bishop's office over that. Now, so so I, I'm curious if it's if it's played out in the FLDS the way that it's played out historically because I think you know in the Mormon religion you you mentioned the law of consecration and mm-hmm. the law of consecration is this law that was laid out by Joseph Smith in the Doctrine and Covenants uh, that essentially describes everybody giving everything that they had and then everything getting distributed equally among the population. Mm-hmm. And it's that's not unique to Mormonism. I mean, that's communism. That's mm-hmm. that's what um, was described by Lenin. And it, he, I I served a two year mission in Russia, and so and then went on to have a, a minor in Russian history and Russian literature. <laughs> and so um, and Russia is also not the first you know populace to try to or attempt to live by communism and over and over historically it doesn't work because there's never a righteous enough leader to equally distribute it Mm -hmm. and so the people at the top always end up getting a little bit more than those who it trickles down to and you know animal farm by orwell is probably one of the best books kind of showing how it played out among the russian populace or hmm. population. And so anyway, I, just, I, I think it's unique. So I'm curious in the FLDS, did it play out similarly where the people at the top got a little bit more and then it kind of trickled down? <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say a little bit more. <laughs> okay. Yeah. A lot more. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it got to where there were, there were months in a row that, that, we didn't have meat mm-hmm. that we didn't have the staple necessities we needed. Mm-hmm. And we were supposed to be going to the storehouse for all of our food. Mm-hmm. You know? And when, when your babies are crying and when they're hungry, it does something to a guy. Yeah. Especially where I'm supposed to be providing for them, you know? And so we just started going and buying what we needed. If we'd, we'd ask for it at the storehouse and if they wouldn't give it to us and we'd go buy it. Yeah. And that caused a lot of problems because yeah. they, they, they wanted to control it so much that, you know, if you're not getting what you need, you're just not humble enough. Yeah. You know? Well, the fact that you had the means to go purchase it at Walmart, did that mean that you weren't fully living <laughs> that law? <laughs> no, I got a new credit card. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so... Before I, I joined the United Order with them, um, I I was a framer. Mm-hmm. I'd ran framing companies, and I'd, I'd had three different crews out running. We were going all over the nation. And and so I, it wasn't new to me on how to, you know, go get a place or go get food or go, go take care of your family. It was more how much can I do in this framework that they have set up and make it work. Yeah. And when it started falling apart, I and mean, we would give our whole paycheck, we would sign over our paycheck to them. We'd go cash it. We'd take the full amount with the receipt, put it in an envelope, so they knew that, that was the amount of your paycheck, yeah. and give it to the church. Along with it, I'd give them a, a, a layout of all my bills. Yeah, I say, okay, I need to pay these, but here's your money. So we're going to do a transaction here. I see. You know, and they'd say, well, we'll get back to you with that. Oh my gosh. So after three months of that, I was like, I can't, uh, everything's going to get cut off. My power, water, everything's going to get cut off. My cars are going to get repossessed. Yeah. We're in, we're in deep, deep trouble here if I don't get that, some money back to take care of that. Yeah. And so I had to quit paying that so that I could take care of the other side of it. Yeah. And that, and that's a lot of where I started going to Walmart. I started taking care of my own needs. And, and you just had one wife. Yes. Yep. That's all I'm admitting to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's all I have. Um, that's all oh, I'm, I'm just curious, like yeah. from a, you know, from the a religious standpoint, was there, was there pressure to take on more wives? How did that work as you kind of grew up and met your, your wife and married and. 
Oh, we can go through that if you want. Yeah, I'm curious. <laughs> so you didn't go out and find a wife. The, the prophet or the leader would assign you a wife. Okay. And so if you weren't worthy of a wife, you wouldn't get a wife. So you were in arranged marriage? Yes. Okay. And so I knew my wife. She was my insurance agent, <laughs> you know, um, and, and she was, you know, she was awesome. She did a really good job for me and, and I was running my business. And so whenever I'd buy a new vehicle, I'd just give her a call. She'd put it on the policy. I'd come in on the weekend, I'd sign all the paperwork and it was, it was nice. So I knew her, she was doing good things. And, uh, and then I get a call one day that, that, uh, I need to go see the prophet. So I went up to ruling Jeff's and, uh, he says that, uh, he says, I, I have a wife for you. Do you want to go get her? Who is it? Because <laughs> you have the right to turn it down, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and he says it's, it's, it's like a calling almost. Yeah. Okay. You know, I have a wife for you. Would you like to go go get her? And I'm like, sure. You know, who was it? And so he he told me. And so I I went over and picked her up, and uh, I I actually looked around for her for a few hours before I could find her. And uh, <laughs> anyway, I, so I ended up at her dad's place, and. Her dad knew for a couple of weeks before I knew. Mm -hmm. And so when I showed up at her dad's place and her dad says, he, he was standing there with his back to me in his kitchen and his kids let me in and I knocked on the door and they says, yeah, dad's expecting you. Mm -hmm. and I go walking in there and he's with his back to me eating a, a sandwich, tuna fish sandwich. Mm -hmm. And uh, with his back to me, he's like, what took you so damn long? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> You talking to me? He finally turns around and he says, what took you so long? He says, I've known about this for two weeks. Where, where were you? I says, I was actually working. I was at, in California on a job. And, uh, you know, so so he he uh, gets her on the phone, says, hey, there's somebody here to talk to you. Hands me the phone. And she was over to her brother's place taking care of some kids. and mm -hmm. And... He just hands me the phone in front of the whole family, you know. And so I take the phone and I just say, hey, uh, I needed some insurance. And she's like, well, I barely set you up your other truck. Mm -hmm. Did you not sign that? I said, oh, I signed it, but I need some different kind of insurance. I go, what do you need? I said, I need some life insurance. And she's like, okay, we don't do life insurance. I said, oh, yes, you do. <laughs> she, she, and then she caught on she's like oh so uh is this what i think it is i says yep i think so so i handed her dad the phone he's like we'll be there in five minutes you know mm -hmm. get your stuff ready and so i went and picked her up mm -hmm. um but basically they decide who you're gonna marry mm -hmm. when you're gonna marry and if you ever get another wife it's the same way they just decide yeah was there any kind of courting between you two no Okay. Nope. Which, you know, down the road, a few years, you have to, you know, now, especially since we're out of the church, mm -hmm. you have to really be determined and make that decision that that's where you want to be. Yeah. Because there was no courting. There was no, you know, dating for two years before you ever got married or anything like that. It was a slam bam. Thank you, ma'am. We're, we're going. Yeah. You know, we're rolling with this thing. And, and we rolled with that thing. We, we've been together for 25 years now. Still together? Still together. How many kids? Seven. But, you know, there was a point there that we had to sit down and, and reconcile and get on the same page because once, I mean, the when you get married in the church, that's the power and authority holding you together. Mm -hmm. That's what put you together. And now that you're not in the church, it's just your love and your your determination to stay together. Yeah. And, and and if you don't make that active decision, then it seems like things fall apart. Yeah. So, yeah, that's my my take on it anyway. I think that's uh, have you ever wondered if there was have you ever have you ever wondered if you missed out on a soulmate or just curious. You know, I I didn't even know about soulmates or anything like that for so long. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Yeah. And I'm not, you know? not here for me. I don't, I don't think it's, I don't believe in soulmates. I, yeah, I've never I experienced anything. Like that, I don't, so. 
I think there's a, I think there's a lot of people that you can connect with. Mm-hmm. I'll share a story with you that my brother-in-law used to tell me. So my brother-in-law, um, when he married my sister Heidi, um, Heidi's the oldest in our family. My parents had six kids, <clears throat> girl at each end, and then four boys in the middle. I was the oldest son, and. So Jeff, who was very devout LDS um, mm-hmm. uh, church member, he and my sister actually were EFY counselors. EFY was especially for youth, this church-sponsored okay. youth camp. And they were counselors at this camp, and that's where they met. And I remember he him telling the story where he wanted to marry Heidi. He knew that he loved her. And so he knelt down to pray, and he said, you know, do I, is this the girl for me? Is, should I marry Heidi? And he said, clear as day, he got an answer. And the answer was, if you want to. <laughs> and, and for a second, he's like, well, wait, wait a second. I thought this would be a very clear yes, a very clear no. And he realized that it, it doesn't matter who that person is. At some point, you have to make the decision, I'm going to make this work. Mm-hmm. I'm going to commit to this person, and I am going to love this person no matter what. And I'm going to abide by that commitment. And so for him, that's what the answer was all about. It was not, yeah, she's your soulmate. You should go ahead and do it. It was, no, she'll work, but are you going to be the man enough to commit to her and do right by her? And yeah. I, I think it's admirable that you've stayed together with, with somebody for 25 years who you didn't have a chance to court. Well, you know, the, in the society, you know, if you went out with a girl, you'd get excommunicated. I mean, you don't go in court and date. Mm-hmm. You don't. It's just absolutely forbidden. And so I knew her. She was she was a friend with my sister. So I've seen her and I've interacted with her and I went to school with her. And so I knew her. So when when he told me who it was I was going to marry, I was like, oh, hell yeah, I I can pull this (laughs) off. You bet. And I asked her, I says, how did you feel when when you were told when your dad told you who you were going to marry? You know, Mm -hmm. and she's like, I was so dang happy. I was like, oh, yeah, we can do this. And so we were really happy with it. You know, yeah. we couldn't have, neither of us would have chose different. Good. If we, if we would have had the full, full, full menu out there, you know, we, we would have chose the same thing. Um, and so down the road, you know, we still have that love and that determination to make it work and that bond. But it, you know, technically we're not married. Legally, we're not. We don't have a marriage certificate, never got one. Oh, interesting. Um, because, you know, the the prophet that put us together, um, he was the one that uh, that held the power. Yeah. You know, so with that, I felt like, why should we? Why yeah. should we go get a, get a court to say, yeah, it's good? I says, we're good. Yeah. You know? Um, and, you know, someday we may. We may go get a court, you know, document that says we're married. Okay, but you know it's a it's really a, a a trial by fire to keep that focus with each other mm-hmm. and and build a family and a legacy together and not let anything destroy that. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's plenty of opportunity for stuff to get destroyed. Yeah, but if we're building it together. And we're going marching the same way, building the same legacy. Why? Why would you want something different? Yeah, you know. So it's it's been beautiful. You know, there's definitely been some trials and some mm-hmm. heartache, um, but it, you know, we're stronger because of it. Yeah. So. So, let's let's backtrack that and and cover the uh, the excommunication. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. <sighs> 2013, the United Order started up, and uh, I was sent. I was I had my construction company, mm-hmm. and uh, I was sent to work for a company that was church owned, and do their sales for them. And I, 
you know, the bishop called me up and told me to go do this. And I'm like, dude, I'm, I pound nails. You know, I build houses. I, I'm not your sales guy. He's like, no, you were recommended, so I want you to go do it. So I did. I went and did it. I went and worked for this company. But now I had all my company bills that were due. And I had to, I had to do a bankruptcy to go work for this company. And so I went back to the bishop. I says, look, you know, why do I have to do a bankruptcy? You know, why can't I just go and go to work? Yeah. And keep my business rolling. And anyway, it, it was kind of a back and forth. He really wanted me under that church controlled business. Yeah. And so I did a, a bankruptcy and so I could work there. And, <laughs> and we worked there for four, four years, I believe it was doing their sales. And during that time frame, they came up with the revelation that, uh, that if you're not a member of the United Order, then you have no rights to your children. Hmm. And so, and, you know, there's a whole bunch of other ones that were crazy too, but that was one that really hurt. Um, and so I had a three and a five-year-old and a 12-year-old. And those guys couldn't live with me because I wasn't a member of the United Order. Why were you not a member? Well... I bought stuff at Walmart for starters. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so were you a member they, at one point and then they let you go? Yes. Okay. I was for a short time. Um, but if ever they detect that you're questioning things, mm -hmm. they automatically don't want you there. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't shape up, then they ship you out. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I, I had a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, I did a lot of things for the bishop. I was working directly with him and, I started questioning what was going on because it didn't, didn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. And then pretty soon he decided that I, I didn't need to be a part of the, of the United order. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, long story. Was that the excommunication or this, no, that's different. That was leading up to it. Okay. So, so, so kicking you out of the United order is different than an excommunication. Right. So you're okay. still a member of the church. Yeah. You're just not of the elite group of, of the United order people. Okay. And so they're, they're always trying to get the, the lay members to behave themselves and qualify to be part of the United Order. It's almost like holding a temple recommend and not holding a temple recommend. I would imagine. I, I'm not familiar with the temple stuff. Yeah, so in, the, so in the Mormon church, if you are worthy enough, you can hold a temple recommend, which allows you access to the, to the temple to perform those ordinances. It's, okay. That's, that, that's just in my mind how I'm relating it. Yeah. Okay. So... My my three younger kids couldn't live with me. Well, uh, there was the two youngest and then one that got skipped. Anyway, there was three total. Mm -hmm. um, and my oldest my oldest son that couldn't live with me, uh, he lasted about a month living with somebody else. Mm -hmm. where, did they, where did they send him? Um, so I could choose where they went. It just had to be with a, with a member family. Mm -hmm. So my brother was a member. I wasn't. So I sent them to live with him. And, you know, it was, it was, you had to do it if you were ever going to, you know, stay a part of the church. Yeah. And so they held that over you. Um, otherwise, if you didn't do it, they'd excommunicate you. And then you're out and you've lost, you know, your, all of your connections and all of everything. Yeah. That you've, that you knew. Um, anyhow, so. He, he lasted about a month at my brother's place, and then he, he came back home. They, they said he was using very foul language. They brought him back home because <laughs> he wasn't worthy to be in a, in a you know, United Order home. Mm -hmm. I was like, hey, that's good. He was pretty happy to be back home. Yeah. Um, but then the two youngest, I have a, a daughter and a son that was there too. They were three and five. Three and five. Yeah, three, five or six. Anyway, right there somewhere. Um. They, they were there for nine months, mm -hmm. and we couldn't talk to them. We couldn't, we couldn't see them. We couldn't communicate in any way with them. Um, and I got to the breaking point. Yeah. You know, I, me and my wife were, were so run down with it. We just says, you know what? The, there's, we're losing the desire to live yeah. without those kids. What, what even made you go along with it for those nine months? It was supposed to be a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. 
And if, if you could rectify the situation in a couple of weeks and have your family back together and be in the church, you know, then everything's good. Yeah. But, you know, every time we'd, we'd, we'd try to talk about it with the bishop, hey, you know, what are we? A couple of weeks because they were going to let you back in the right. order and you were going to be worth, okay. Supposed to be. Okay. But as time went on, it, it didn't happen. And then I started seeing the signs that uh, they, so when they did a few things in there when, when they were setting up the United Order and basically even somebody that wasn't a member of the United Order, they needed to contribute everything they had to the, to the church mm-hmm. to build up the United Order that hopefully someday they can be a part of. You know, and so it was kind of a, a you know, a stick and carrot method. Yeah. Um, and so the, the bishop comes to me one day and says, uh, we need your, your framing set up. I'm like, there's plenty of framing setups around here. You know, I said, no, we need your, your tools, your trailer, your, all of your stuff for a project we're doing. And uh, I ended up giving it to him. Signed it over to him, gave him the title to it, and um, we're what seventy thousand dollars in in the setup, and and I did that with the hopes that I could get my kids back, get my family back together, yeah. stay stay in the church because I'm helping, I'm building, I'm participating in it. Yeah. You know? And my kids didn't come home, didn't come home. Uh, finally, I, I started calling. I was like, hey, I. I want to know what we got to do here, but I need my kids back. Yeah. And they quit taking my calls. And so I, I took two weeks and, uh, I, I went to Phoenix or to, uh, to, uh, McAllen, Texas, cause I was an insurance adjuster and I went down there on a, a storm claim and I spent a couple of weeks down there and just cleared my head. And, uh, when I got back home, and I went up and sat by my dad's grave. And I just said, Dad, what, what do I do? If I make the stand against the church and get my kids back, we have to move because yeah. the church will, will destroy us. Yeah. And, you know, once you make that stand, it's over. When you say the church will destroy us? Um, basically, it's being like being a, a, an apostate right out of the gate. Mm-hmm. And you know, in the LDS church, you don't associate with apostates and you, you don't hang around them. You don't, um, your, your family's sep- I mean, their, their judgment all of a sudden of you is, is very negative if you stand against what they believe. Yeah. So this was going to be a social suicide. Yeah. You weren't worried about your life. No. Okay. No, I was worried about me taking a life. Yeah. More than that. <laughs> not having, yeah, not having your kids, I can imagine. And it was getting to that point, though, that something was going to change. Something just had to change. And, and so I, I sat there at my dad's grave, and I just asked him, I said, Dad, what do you think? What should I do? If I get the kids back, we're going to be kicked out, and we're going to lose everything that's here. And I says, we can go somewhere else. We can, we can move on and we'll go build another business. We can you know, go rent some houses. We can do whatever, but I need to know what I should do. Because we're right at this turning point, at the crossroads, and he he told me loud as and clear as day. He says, "You get those kids back," mm-hmm. and that was his life. He loved his kids, and he wouldn't have put up with that for two seconds. Mm-hmm. So when he told me that, then I got on my phone on the way back from the graveyard and I started calling the bishop's office. And finally, after about two hundred calls, then I got through. Mm-hmm. Um, they had a very selective process of answering the phones, especially mm-hmm. if you weren't in the United Order. Mm-hmm. You know. Anyway, so I finally got a hold of the bishop's office, and I says, this is Thurkle. I need you to tell the bishop that my kids are going to come home today. They, they've got to come home, and if they don't come home, I will come get them. But they will be home tonight. And it's like, wow. You really want us to tell him that? I says, yeah, if you want to. I says, but that's what will happen. Yeah. They will be home today. And that night they, they came home. They got dropped off on my porch. And, uh, you know, we, we took them. I moved to Idaho and got a, as far away from, from Colorado City as I could. And 
I didn't tell them where I went. Didn't tell them, you know, my address or anything. I still had the same phone number. Mm-hmm. But they called wanting to know where I was moving, where I was going, where I was living. I says, no, you got my phone number. And that's good enough. And I wouldn't tell them. Um, and so basically, by doing that, um, there came a revelation after I did that mm-hmm. that said that I was no longer worthy to be a part of the church. I need to go away and repent because I had committed adultery 23 years ago before I was married. Mm-hmm. And that, that's what they came up with. That's what they told you had yeah. happened. And I, I or they laughed. Told them. <laughs> I laughed. I says, now, you know, I can see this happening with me. But this revelation wasn't specific with my name. It was Elroy Nielsen's sons. It was all of my dad's kids, all my dad's sons. So all of us, all, I think there's seven of us, boys, were kicked out for the same, on the same revelation the same day. <laughs> and so I called him out on that. And I says, hey, uh, this seems quite ironic. You know, I, I was definitely the wild child of the family. So the church came out and said all of Elroy Nelson's kids committed adultery 23 years ago. Yeah. And they all, therefore, must leave the church. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Sure. That, that checks like, out. <laughs> go away and repent, and you'll be called back when you're worthy. Uh-huh. But go away by yourself and do this. Leave your families behind. Because then the church would come in and take those families take and families. reassign them yeah. to other men. But when I got that call, I was living in Idaho with yeah. my family. And, you know, I, I remember I had a two and a half hour conversation with the bishop about that. Yeah. Because it didn't line up with the scriptures. And I kind of went over this on, on that other podcast with Mark. But, sure. you know, <laughs> coming from the scriptures, it says God is a God of truth and he cannot lie or he ceases to be God. God is a God of truth. And so when that came and they read it to me, I said, no, wait, 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 wait. I need you to reread that again because this didn't happen. I want to know if I just heard something wrong. I mean, there's a million things that they could have kicked me out for. We weren't supposed to do any recreation. I'll, I'll, I'll go into that different. Um, <laughs> but basically, after the conversation with the bishop, he says, are you refusing to accept this revelation? I says, I am got a lot of questions about this one. Um, it's not from God, not the God I worship. So send it back to wherever you got it from and get these questions answered. First off, I have a right to stand before a quorum and face my accuser. I, I call upon that right. Mm-hmm. He says, well, that'll never happen. I says, I know it won't because there's nobody, it's, uh, there's not a victim. There's nobody out there that this ever happened to. So, of course, it's not going to happen. And if I can't stand up for my rights, I, what good is it? You know, what good are the, the scriptures, mm-hmm. the doctrines that you're supposed to be living by? Anyway, we had this dialogue for a few hours and uh, went back and forth on it, and I couldn't accept it. I says it'd be a, a dishonor to my family, dishonor to me, to say, yeah, yeah, I did that 23 years ago, and yeah, I'm not worthy of my family. Come take them. That ain't going to happen. Yeah. And so... I stayed with my family. Um, he actually asked, where's your family? I said, they're right here. And he's like, oh, they're with you. I said, they are with me. He's like, oh, okay. I said, do you need my wife's number? <laughs> and he's like, no, I think I have it. I said, okay, that's cool. Call her. Talk to her. I'm sure she'll tell you how she feels. Yeah. Um, but after we did that, I talked to my wife, and I says, you know, how do you feel about us doing this? Because we're basically cutting the church off. I mean, they're, they, we can't associate with anybody in the church anymore. We're out here all by ourselves in this big, bad world that we are going to have to make our mark mm-hmm. without the help of anybody we know from the past. And she's like, I would have went with you 10 years ago if you would have said it. If you would have said the word, we w- I would have been glad to go. But she was hanging in there for me, hoping I'd make the decision. Yeah. And I was hoping to not lose her if I made that decision. And we couldn't talk about it because if you bring that up while you're in the church, you know, you will be thrown under the bus. Yeah. For even questioning them. So that's kind of what happened there. Um, you know, they they had the screws on us so tight, you know, as far as, you know, 
no recreation. Um, if you're not a part of, the, you know, if you're not part of the United Order, then legally or not legally, but according to church principles, you're not married either, because mm -hmm. you hold no priesthood, so you can't hold your wife. Mm -hmm. And so you can't have sex. You can't be together. You have to live in separate rooms. You know, if even on the same premises. Yeah. And you're not worthy of your kids. They're not your kids now. They're the Lord's kids. Yeah. And he can decide what to do with them. So they'd send the Lord's representative from the bishop's office uh, over to, you know, take your kids or go do what they want with your family. Yeah. And I just says, no, that, that is not how it rolls. So they get, <clears throat> they get a little more overt with it, but I've been through the same kind of mind fuck my, uh -huh. myself. That's, and I, I apologize to any of my listeners, but that's exactly what it is. Um, because when you, for me, um, you get excommunicated and it's, I've, I've gone through the process twice. I'm through it once and then went through all the steps to come back again and then went through it again. And they tell you, you no longer have these temple blessings. You no longer have you are stripped of your covenants and your mm -hmm. rights that you were given. And it, in that, that includes being sealed to your family, being sealed to your children. And that is when you f are, f are taught from a young age that that's the truth and that that's what you are fully invested in and believe. To go home one night and then to get hit with that realization of, oh, oh my gosh, what, what, what if, God, what if they're right? What if I don't have my kids? What if these things that, and for me, it was things I'd done. For you, it's things you never did. <laughs> and <clears throat> you have to reconcile that somehow. You have to decide what it is you believe. For me, if I still believed in that, I'd be back in. Mm -hmm. Because just like you, there's nothing that I wouldn't do to, to make sure I was with my kids. Right. And so for me, that reconciliation came in deciding that I no longer believed that. That's... That's exactly what we had to <clears throat> had to face, you know. It was. Uh, I remember after hanging up the phone with the, with him, and uh, with the bishop, I put my head down on my hands on my desk, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, Becky, what just happened?" Because this whole thing is going to fly apart. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that I had was my family. And I was going to protect them with everything I had. Yeah. And, you know, we were, we, we moved up to, by Jackson Hall. And uh, <laughs> we didn't want anybody knowing where we were. Yeah. And they tried to come up. They, they came up clear up to Idaho Falls. And they'd call me, hey, I'm in Idaho Falls, you know, somebody from the bishop's office. I need to talk to you. I'm like, yeah, go back home. Thank you for coming. It's a nice drive, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go back home now. Well, just tell us where you're at. I, says, I will not. But they've tried to take your family. Yeah. Well, they wanted to come and talk to us about it. Yeah. But in ultimate, you know, that's what they wanted. They wanted to get between me and my wife mm -hmm. so they could separate the family. Yeah. And, you know, we, we weren't about to do that. Yeah. And I had to realize that it depends on how far you want to dig. But you start questioning everything going back. Um, when that revelation came and it was so far off base, I was like, how the hell did they get that? <laughs> I mean, they could have said that I'd slept with my wife and I wasn't supposed to because I didn't hold priesthood. They could have said a thousand other things that I had done sure. <laughs> and, and made me, you know, a little more accurate on, on excommunicating me or kicking me out. Yeah. But they hadn't. And now that I bring this up, it'll probably come out. <laughs> There's new ones all the time. New revelations coming. Um, so you you mentioned something. Um, I want to kind of close a little bit with this because, and I'm gonna 
call this back to the podcast you did with Mark McCormack. So on, on the President McCormack podcast, we'll, we'll give him a drop here. There we go. Um, and you actually talked about something that Jimmy asked you. He asked you if you would, what you would change about your story. And it reminded me of an experience I had, but I want you to reshare that and I'll, I'll tell you the experience I had. <laughs> so when Jimmy asked me that, what I would change, you know, I don't know that I would change who I am mm -hmm. because ultimately my experiences have got me to where I am right now. And yeah, there's the money and the things that, that we've turned in and that we've lost and uh, that we've been screwed out of. But if I, if I go back and change that, it changes the outcome. Yeah. And so I'm glad I'm where I'm at. And we had so many good experiences living there at the Creek. I, I wouldn't change that. Yeah. Um, every Thanksgiving we'd do a house in a day project. Literally we'd pull 10,000 people and they'd, there'd be 4,000 at a time working on this house. And literally we'd build it in 24 hours. Yeah, I went and watched the YouTube video. Oh, was it pretty cool? Yeah, it's awesome. There's a lot of ants, huh? It's awesome. So that was only look, one look of them. Look up House in a Day on YouTube. It's really cool. Yeah. And and that was us there. You know, in, in one of those, you can see my truck and trailer and my <laughs> forklift. And it was like, you know, we're all part of it. Everybody pulled together. Yeah. And that's carried us so far, that determination that, hey, let's work together and figure out a solution. And when you have 4,000 people working on a house, you have to be creative about your solutions. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, you get so many driver uh, personalities there mm -hmm. that you have to you have to negotiate your way through it yeah. and be pliable. Um, but that determination and that drive and the resilience that people coming from that community have is very noteworthy. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the one, another guy in our group, he says uh, he used to he used to do concrete in St. George, and he knew a bunch of the Cricker kids. And uh, he he was like, "Oh, you're from you're from Colorado City. I know I know a bunch of guys there. The hardest damn working guys I know." <laughs> and and it's true, you know, we do work hard. We try to make our mark. Well, I just so. I just think that this is, and I'm going to again go back to the the to history on this is the there's such beauty in it in this in this law, and I think that that's a a law of the universe that the the more beautiful something is or the more um, exceptional something can be the farther that that thing can fall if done in the wrong way so something can be exceptionally beneficial for you when it's done or used in the wrong way it can be that much that powerful on the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, all right, so I'm going to ask you this question that a friend of mine asked last week because this is what reminded me of what you reminded me of when you told that story about not changing anything. My buddy Dan asked me, he said, Would you trade your life for anybody else's? And just think about it for a second. Like you, you think about the experiences you have, who you are, what you've gone through. Would you trade your life for anybody else's? I wouldn't. No. You know, the, the, it's a personal. It's got us to where we are and, and build us into who we are. And, you know, even if you traded with somebody else, would you have those experiences? No. No. No, and I, I, I felt the same way. It took me a second. I thought about it for a second. And I thought, oh, Elon would be cool for a day. <laughs> 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 but then Elon's probably got a whole shitstorm of problems I don't want to face. Uh, no, not at all. And I, it made me laugh because Jimmy's always told me this story. Um, he's probably shared it with the group or with you in, in the past, too. He tells this hilarious story where one day he, he wakes up and he's got this big grin on his face. This girl's there. And she's like, what, what are you so happy about? And he looks at her and says, I get to go be Jimmy Rex today. <laughs> <laughs> and I've always heard that story as, yeah, Jimmy's got this really cool life. Like, how cool it must be to be Jimmy. And I realized when my friend Dan asked me that question, I missed the whole point of the damn story. The whole point of the story is 
we should all be living our life where we wake up every day with a big grin on our face and say, God damn it, I wouldn't trade this for anything. I get to go be Nick Allen today. And I get to go be Thurkel Nilsson today. What a beautiful day. That's the whole point of the story. Right. And yeah, your, your comment on the podcast reminded me of that. And uh, it's a, it's a great way to live. It is. And, and, you know, I'm, I'm excited about my life and what, what, what the future holds for me mm-hmm. because I, we've built up a lot of momentum and a lot of experiences for a reason. Mm-hmm. Not sure what that reason is yet, but it's soon to be found out, you know, and, and it's got us to where we are. Mm-hmm. I'm proud of that. You know, and I'm super proud of my family for sticking with me through all that. Yeah. The, the most prized treasure we have is our family. You know, my son's in the Navy. Shout out to Elroy. Um, <laughs> he, he called me after I did that other podcast, and he's like, Dad, thank you so much for doing that. He says it must have taken a hell of a lot of balls to, to <laughs> put that out there because nobody talks about it, about the inside workings of what happened. Yeah. He says, I, I, w- I lived through all that with you. You know, and he, he was so thankful to hear that story, Yeah. you know, and he, he says it, it means a lot to me because I remembered pieces, but I d- forgot the details. Yeah. And he's like me and my, my Navy buddies are here listening to this and they're like, dude, so all the, all this crap you've been telling us the last couple of years, you're not just clear full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you tell it with such clarity but also with such a love for that part of your life um at at least for the good parts of it yeah and i think i i appreciate that the most it's you are not a victim to that story um and that's what makes it powerful do we have one more minute absolutely i want something else to share about elroy absolutely so back when we were making the decision to get the kids back. Mm-hmm. This boy's 12 years old, you know. Um, it may have been 14. Anyway, I was an emotional wreck because I knew all hellfire was going to break loose the minute I pulled that trigger and the minute I stood up and, and got those kids back. It had put the wheels in motion to make me you know, lose my family. And I was determined to not lose my family over it. I was going to keep them. So I I was outside and I had some storage containers with with all my construction stuff in it. And I was out by this container and I I needed some away time, some quiet time. And I was out there and uh, this 14-year-old boy, you know, 12, 14, he comes up and He's like, Dad, what you doing? And it was dark. Um, I was just, I was thinking of how to, to put them, put it in motion to where we could actually move to Idaho with the family and have all this happen. And yet, the the fact of losing the the faith and losing the the church, my own brothers are going to stand against me. Mm-hmm. We are on our own. Once we make that decision, 100% on our own. <laughs> so everybody you know from the past is not going to be your friend anymore. And I, ha- I was having a hard time deciding how to play this out with the least amount of injury possible. And I was out there uh, leaning against this container, and uh, he comes up and he wraps his arm around me. And uh, (laughs) he says, Dad, let's just do it. Let's go. He says, you got me. I got you. Let's go get him. Let's move. Let's do this. (laughs) And I sat back and I was like, what a damn cool kid, you know? Um, that That was a defining moment. Because we knew it was the right thing to do. And 
he had he had the gumption to back me up before I even presented it to the family. He was like, "No, we we will do this," you know. So shout out on that. That was pretty cool. Good for you, Elroy. <laughs> anyway, Darkle, I really appreciate you coming on here, man. Thank you. Getting authentic, sharing your story. It's a beautiful story. I'm really, I'm really happy to have you in my life. Likewise, my friend. Thanks, brother. Thanks, Nick. Thank you so much for listening to The Naked Patient Beyond the Operating Room. I'm Dr. Nicholas Howland. Please remember that every patient who appears on this podcast has consented to discuss their story and their surgery on the podcast. That way we, re we remain HIPAA compliant. This is a free podcast. The best thing that you can do for us is to leave us a review online. Let us know what you liked. Let us know what you'd like to hear. Let us know how we can improve. If you are curious about anything related to plastic surgery, you can reach out to me on Instagram at Dr. Nicholas Howland, and I typically respond there, or you can reach us at the office at 801-571-2020, or we have an online form you can fill out at the website, www.howlandplasticsurgery.com. Any of our coordinators would be happy to help you. Thanks again for listening. Thanks for listening to the Naked Patient Podcast. Stay tuned for the next episode. Till next time.